My name is Connor Masick. I am the Avian Education Specialist here at the National Eagle Center. And today we are going to be talking about the mighty Mississippi River. There are so many different things to talk about, so we're going to start literally with the beginning. It's length. The Mississippi River is the second longest river in North America. It is not the first, despite some people thinking so. That honor goes to the Missouri River, actually. It tends to be about 100 miles or so longer. And notice that I said tens, because length is actually a somewhat disputed topic when it comes to rivers. Different characteristics can change throughout the year. If you have a particularly wet summer or spring, you're going to get a little bit longer as Different sections, different meanders, offshoots of the river itself get cut off. Or if it's a particularly wet season, these guys can get made where they weren't previously. That can all factor into the length of the main river. Alongside just having larger amounts of water being in the area, alongside just having those larger amounts, silt deposition, little bits of soil coming down from further north and then creating or cutting off meanders such as these can also affect the length. To the point that, the length of the Mississippi is actually a somewhat disputed topic. No regulatory body can actually really agree on how long it is. Staff at Lake Itasquia State Park say that's right around 2,550 miles. That park is right at the headwaters of the Mississippi, which is also somewhat disputed, but we'll be getting into that just a little bit later. The U.S. Geological Survey states a number right around 2,300 miles from tip to bottom for the Mississippi River. The uh, Environmental Protection Agency says 2320 for my length. And then the Mississippi River National Recreation Area says right around 2350 for length. So no one can really agree on it, but it's still a long river and it is the second largest in North America. When it comes to the river system, that's the main river of the Mississippi and every tributary that leads into it, for the length, it's somewhat disputed again. Where you combine rivers can also be a bit of an issue. If you combine the Missouri, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers together, it is the third longest river system, actually no, the second longest river system in the world. Four, if you just combine the Missouri and then the Mississippi, we actually come out at number four for length of river system, behind the Nile River in Africa, the Amazon River in South America, and then the Yangtze River in China. All that still pretty long river. After the length, we then get into the width. That is just as variable as the length of the river itself. Again, water currents, different times of year, that can all affect the width, but on average, up at Lake Itasquia, or Itasquia, my apologies, that lake, that river is only 20 to 30 feet across, and it's only a couple of feet deep. It is very, very shallow at its headwaters. Then, when you get to Lake Winnebagoshish in Minnesota, which the Mississippi River flows through and technically counts as part of the Mississippi, it's 11 miles wide. So going from 20 feet to 11 miles. Pretty massive size difference there. On average, it tends to be between two to 500 feet in width, but again, that can change throughout the year. Then, when it comes to the watershed itself, I previously mentioned that some people attribute the length of the river to the river itself, the main channel, and then all of its tributaries. That is technically referred to as the watershed. The watershed covers an insane amount of area. The watershed of the Mississippi covers right around 1.2 million square miles. That's 40% of the continental US. 40% is what this area covers up in its watershed. That is an astounding amount of area. And what's even more astounding is actually the speed and volume that this river puts out. It's pretty staggering. Speed less so than volume. Average speed tends to be about 1.2 to 1.5 miles per hour. That's the average fast-paced walking speed for a human. Not so impressive there, but when you get down to southern Louisiana and into New Orleans, the speed is double that, right around three miles per hour. That doesn't sound too impressive, but it's a pretty interesting fact that when you start at Lake Itasquia, it takes right around three months from water leaving the lake to travel all the way down the Mississippi and reach the Gulf of Mexico. Three-month trip for just that bit of water. But where the real impressive numbers are is the amount of water that the river is putting out. Up at Lake Itasca, right around 44, 45 gallons per second is the flow rate. 
Up by St. Anthony's Falls in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities in Minnesota, the flow rate is just shy of 90,000 gallons per second. 90,000. And that is dwarfed by the flow rate down by, by New Orleans. Four and a half million gallons per second flow by down by New Orleans. That is a staggering amount of water. But it doesn't give you a great visual. Everyone knows what a gallon of water looks like, but it's still a bit of a weird metric. So, can you guys all picture the average 48-foot semi-trailer? Always terrifying when you're driving past them on the highway. At least, I am at least. That trailer holds just shy of 27,000 gallons of water. It would take roughly 10 minutes for one 48-foot semi-trailer to flow from Lake Itasca into the Mississippi River. Up at St. Anthony's Falls in Minneapolis, three 48-foot semi-tankers worth of water flow over the falls every second. And then down by New Orleans, 166 semis flow past a single point every single second. That is a staggering amount of water. And we use all of this water to our advantage. Tons of cargo ships go up and down the Mississippi as far north as Minneapolis and then going all the way down to the Gulf. And the amount of shipping that is done on there is pretty staggering. And what also is used for the Delta itself and also the watershed. Right around 92% of U.S. agriculture and 78% of the world's food grain and soybeans are grown in the Mississippi watershed. And on the river itself, 60% of U.S. agricultural goods are shipped down the Mississippi, be it for commercial use in our own country or then later out shipped for worldwide use. That is an insane and staggering amount of statistics there. But it's not just us that are using this river. It is birds, fish, reptiles, mammals. This is more than just for us. Nature is astounding as to what it uses. For the birds, right around 60% of bird species, that's 326 species of North American birds, use this river as a flyway going from their northern breeding grounds to their southern overwintering grounds on the Gulf or as far south as South America. They use this main section of the Mississippi and the little offshoots in the back, the backwaters, as kind of landing zones. They can't go all the way from South America or the Gulf all the way back up to their northern breeding grounds. They need to take rest stops too, just like we would from a long trip. And so this river provides shallow areas where they can rest outside of the main current, plentiful amounts of food. All of that is provided here by the river. And since it is a river, it's going to have a lot of fish. Dozens and dozens of fish species utilize this river. In fact, right around 25% of North American fish species can be found in the Mississippi River. And they're all found throughout the entire different types of habitat. The main channel where it's rushing and flowing, slower moving backwaters, they're only a couple of feet deep and almost stagnant in places where there's very low oxygen. Certain species can survive that fairly easily. Tons of different uses for this. And unfortunately, this kind of habitat is perfect for some hidden invaders that usually we are the cause for. One such hidden invader most people tend to know a lot about, especially if you're an outdoorsman and you go out and use this kind of stuff for recreation. Zebra mussels are one of the most prolific problems when it comes to river and lake systems. These guys are very, very tiny. They're only on average about one to one and a half inches long with barely pushing two. Very distinctive animals. They have those little stripes along the shell. They were originally from Eastern Europe, actually. The Caspian, Black, and Azov Seas in particular. They got here in a very, very sneaky way that most people wouldn't tend to think of. It wasn't really by attaching to the hulls of boats. It was in minuscule larval form, so minuscule that you need a microscope to see them, from ballast waters. Ballast is used to keep ships balanced when they're traversing oceans or even rivers such as this. Helps keep them from rocking and tipping. Water tends to be pretty good at that, depending. And when it's inside there, you get little microscopic travelers. And when that ballast water gets dumped into different areas when they're docking at ports, you get hundreds, if not thousands, and millions of individual guys into the river. Now, what exactly is the big problem with zebra mussels? Well, they breed like crazy. One female is mature at right around two years of age, and they can live four to five years. And every year, one female can make between two to three million eggs from one zebra mussel. And they tend to, once they inhabit an area, overtake it because of that massive breeding and population rate. 
But the real problem comes in into just how prolific those numbers become and what they do to the environment that they're in. These guys love to attach to hard surfaces. Any hard surface will do. The rocks all along the river, pipes that are in intake and outtake sources from different factories, or on the shells of native mussels. There have been studies that have shown that on one native mussel, there have been upwards of 10,000 individual zebra mussels on that one native species. And when they get on those guys, as you can imagine, it would affect movement, respiration, feeding, breeding. All of those things are affected when you have 10,000 hitchhikers on top of you. And then you also get things like clogging pipes and intake pipes for ourselves. These guys are so incredibly prolific, that they will literally clog pipes. You won't even be able to get anything through them, and that can cause a big problem for us, but alongside that, they're wreaking havoc on our environment. They're all throughout the main Mississippi and pretty much in every single of the Great Lakes. But they do do something that's pretty interesting. They are filter feeders for the most part. They are filtering microscopic particles out of the water, and when they do that, they're actually making the water cleaner. Usually, people don't think about cleaner water being a problem, but when it's not naturally that way, it actually can be. It can actually make it so that plants go through exponential growth. With the water being cleaner, more light can filter down to the bottom, which can cause a boom even in native plant species, but that affects the bottom topography and also just the food web itself. Alongside being an effect on the food web, cleaner water means site predators have an easier time spotting their prey, which can mean species that were usually hidden in murkier areas now are easily visible and easily caught, which can affect the food web in a pretty devastating way when there's no prey because the predators are having such an easy time hunting. That can even cause a crash in certain areas, which has happened. They also outcompete native filter feeder, feeder species. Our mussels just aren't that efficient when compared to zebra mussels. And alongside that, zebra mussels breed far more prolifically than our own species. So the natives are getting pushed out to the point that zebra mussels are the only native bivalves in the area. What we can all do to help get rid of these guys or at least slow their flow? Check your boats. That tends to be the biggest thing. If that boat has been there for a good chunk of time, you're probably gonna have some zebra mussels attached to it. So clean your boat off. Spray it down with hot water, scrape off any of the bivalves, take any chunks of uh, aquatic vegetation out. Also, empty your motors. As I said, these guys originally came in ballast water, so those microscopic little larvae that they start out as can be anywhere. So if you have water in your motor and you don't drain it, they're gonna grow up in the motor to the point that they have been known to break motors because they grew up and then clogged them. That shell inside your motor, when you have a couple hundred of those little guys, yeah, your motor's not gonna start with that. So, moral of the story, clean your stuff, and you can help keep our environments a little bit cleaner than it would be with the mussels. We are also having that problem with a somewhat larger species. The silver carp has been wreaking havoc through a good chunk of the southern Mississippi and its tributaries. Silver carp aren't predatory animals. They are filter feeders. They are originally found in Asia, and they are very good at what they do to the point that agricultural farms and such that used aquaculture to grow plants brought in silver carp for algae control. And alongside that, they sold the fish for food because silver carp are really, really tasty. They originally were found in those aquaculture plants. Some of them escaped. Most of them were in the south, and when they had tremendous amounts of rain, they could sometimes get washed into the main river areas, which eventually tend to feed back to the Mississippi. Eventually, enough of them escaped from those fish farms and aquaculture plants that they were able to establish a pretty significant population. These little guys start off small. They grow to be at maximum about two and a half, maybe pushing three feet, and 60 pounds at the top end. 30 to 40 tends to be a little bit more common, but these guys can get very huge very fast. And that's where the problem comes in for these guys. They're not quite as prolific as the zebra mussels when it comes to breeding, but they are even more efficient filter feeders. These guys can filter to the point that a microscopic speck of dust cannot escape the filter on their gills. They filter to the microscopic level, and that is far, far more efficient than our own native filter feeder species like buffalo. Similar kind of species to carp that are found in Asia, we have the buffalo, smallmouth and big mouth buffalo. They, our filter feeders, just not quite as good as the silver carp. And so they are getting pushed out because they don't have anything to eat because the silver carp's eating all of it. 
Silver carp also have a very interesting defense mechanism. Whenever a predator is coming by, the different vibrations that they can sense through the water, entire schools will jump out of the water, just like you see here. That is pretty common whenever you get boat motors going by. The vibrations caused by a boat's motor are pretty similar to that caused by a predatory fish hunting and swimming around a school of silver carp. And they will explode out of the water. And remember when I said those guys weigh 60 pounds at the top end? You're gonna get clocked in the head with something going 10 miles an hour, jumping out of the water, that's 60 pounds? These guys have killed people. They have damaged property, damaged boats, caused concussions, massive amounts of damage and trauma to us. To the point that you really don't really want a fish flying into your face. Everybody's heard about, oh, they're jumping into my boat. That's an old fisherman saying. You don't want that to be literal when these guys are knocking you out of your boat. So one of the best things you can do when it comes to silver carp control, if you catch them, take them home. These guys are delicious. They are feeding in the water column as opposed to some of their cousins that are feeding on the bottom. When you're feeding on the bottom, you tend to get a lot of nasty muck gunk stuff that makes the flesh taste pretty disgusting, unless you do a couple of different things to it. But when they're feeding in the water column itself, they're feeding pretty cleanly on that microscopic plankton, algae, different kinds of microscopic organisms, to the point that they're delicious. I've had some when I was further south. They were pretty good. So if you catch them, take them home. All of that is preventable. They are currently in the southern sections of the Mississippi and the tributaries. They haven't really been showing too much signs of going north, but it is a potential problem. But thankfully, when it comes to zebra mussels, silver carp, any kind of invasive species, all of us can do different things. Check your local DNR website for whatever state you guys are in to see what potential invaders are there and what you can do to make sure that they don't spread any further. Everybody loves the Mississippi. Everybody loves the recreation that this provides, be it for fishing, hunting, boating, swimming. All of it's enjoyable and everyone should be able to enjoy it. And we'll all be able to enjoy it longer if those nasty little invaders aren't coming up from everywhere. We all have a responsibility to do the best for our environment and to make sure that everyone can keep enjoying it. But now that the doom and gloom is a bit done, you guys know what you can do to make sure that this stays as pristine as it currently is. Thank you guys so much for joining me today on the Mighty Mississippi, and have a good rest of your day, folks.